talk about mental well-being as a chief exec, uh, an entrepreneur of a successful multi-million pound business. Talk me through realizations you realized about your own state of mental well-being in that journey. And what could you share with other people that sometimes wouldn't necessarily openly talk about it? I mean, I openly talk about it because I'm... (laughs) I'm probably one of the people, if you meet me, that you probably least expect to have mental health issues, I guess. You know, people expect me to be um, confident or they expect me to, you know, deal with it. I'm six foot two, you know, I train quite a bit. So from the outside, it looks like, oh, he's probably got his himself well put together. And I would never have envisaged that I would go through kind of my journey that I went through. When I set up the business, um, I had no idea that I was going to encounter mental health. And what actually happened, just to, to give you an idea, was it was right in the first one, so it was through the, in, in the middle of the partnership, and um, I would just constantly get like blurred vision or just like a sensation in my hands, a tingle maybe, or a little bit of palpitation or a little bit of worry, a little bit of worry. I don't know about what, just a bit of worry, and it would lend itself to physical things like a bit of sweating or, or so on. That's how it started. And then it just kind of got worse, gradually got worse. And then it kind of evolved into a stage where I would just have panic attacks. So the first panic attack I had was walking down the street. And I just thought, wow, fuck, what's going on? And my heart was coming out of my chest and and, and my legs turned to like lead. I couldn't put one leg in front of the other. And then I just sunk to like what was like a, a park bench. And I remember just like rolling. It was a sunny day. And I remember just rolling over as if to make everybody think that I was just um, going to sleep on a sunny day on a park bench. Like that was a normal thing to do. But at that minute in time, it felt like the most normal thing. And um, I remember lying there thinking, I think I was 27 then, 28, something like that. And I thought, I'm going to die. I'm at, this must be what a heart attack feels like. You know, my chest is beating. I can't move my legs. I, I don't really want to tell anyone. I feel a bit embarrassed. So it's either shout for help. Or just shut your eyes and hope for the best. So and I went for the second option. And I lay there for about 40 minutes or something like that. And then slowly I was able to like get to my feet. I was get to my car. I remember driving to my mum's house. Don't know why, but I drove to my mum's house. And she was in. My mum works for me, by the way. And she was my second or third employee. And she worked with me. So I don't know why she was in, but she was. And I remember the minute I walked into the house, and that, and that house was kind of the house... I'd always lived in from the age of like one to 22 or whenever I moved out. And it was like immediately I lay on the sofa. She made me a cup of tea and some toast and it had gone. I was just normal. And I remember thinking, what on earth was that? And I just thought, oh, maybe I had a funny turn. So one or two days later, bang, I'm at a client. I'm in a meeting now. I'm looking and I'm thinking, can he tell what's going through my mind right now? Because What's going through my mind is I'm going to pass out in his boardroom. It's a new client that I want to sign. It was a football club at the time. It was a sport, uh, professional league football club. And I'm thinking, oh, fuck, I'm going to pass out in the middle of this. And, you know, he's going to take me to hospital. And that went, and and and, and then I'd get through it, maybe. And then there'd be other times. And then it got to a point where literally for about six months, I would just... I'd be on, and I'd be, I'd get it at home. I'd ring A and E, and A and E will they know what it is, so they'll always say you have to get yourself to hospital. And I remember shouting at the woman on the nine nine nine, saying, "This is ridiculous! You know, I'm dying in my home here. I haven't got anybody to bring me in. I need an ambulance." And they were saying, "You have to get yourself in." I remember thinking, "What a lousy system this is!" Where you know, um, yeah, I'm laying on the sofa and I can't get to the front door. I'm on my hands and knees. That's how sort of detrimental physically it got. Um, and I just couldn't. Anyway, lo and behold, 30, 40 minutes later, I was able to drive myself in. And they put me on an ECG. And within 30 seconds, I was back to normal. But for about six months, I needed a doctor to keep ECG me to tell me that I was normal. As soon as he said, there's nothing wrong with your heart, Paul, I was fine again. And I could just go home. Uh, that lasted six months. Um So that was my initial start to it. So my journey is I've lived with it now for 11, 12 years. I think I've had one funny turn like that in that 11 or 12 years. Um, How do I deal with it is the the next question. Uh, I I never go. uh, So uh, first of all, I'm like this with everything is that there's natural things can't 
prevent everything and they can't mend everything. But you, in my eyes, you can't have something wrong with you and not do all the natural things, just in my eyes, that you should do in order to give yourself the best chance. And by the way, if that doesn't work, you go to a doctor and you get professional help. That's just the way it is. But I, do, I don't understand these people who will say, I'm anxious and they have five coffees a day. Or I'm anxious and they go and, uh, the weekend worries and they go and drink all weekend and then Monday they're, um, they're back to square one again. So with me, I make sure I'm a two litres of water every day, right? Because I just don't know why people wouldn't do that. I make sure before I go to bed at night, I game like a warm up at the gym, I cool down and I put myself in a dark space ready to go to sleep because I, in my head, sleep is one of the most important parts of mental health. And we just don't learn enough about how to get people are on the phones, they've got the TV on, they've got lights on in the room, they've got all these things that the body doesn't want when it wants to go to sleep. So I take sleep seriously and I'm hydrated all the time. Um, not all the time because we're not all perfect, but certainly if I feel anxious, I am. Uh, I cut out refined sugars when I feel anxious. I cut out any crap in my diet. Uh, I love that. I love. I'm a, I'm, my diet is in general um, can be bad at the weekend with kids. I've got four kids, so you know it's sweets and treats and all the rest of it. But I make sure Monday to Friday I, I live in a disciplined um, nutritional state. Um, so that's drink, water, diet, sleep, exercise, exercise every day, six days a week. I'm not somebody who goes in the gym. And by the way, I did this before where I've been anxious and then I've gone into the gym and tried to blast out huge sessions and the body's already broken down. So when you're in a broken down um, anxiety or depressive, and I've never been depressive, but when you're in, when you've kind of got mental pressure, the last thing your body I think needs is to continuously put it then under physical pressure. So I go to the gym and I enjoy my sessions. I don't put myself under pressure. I don't try and break records. I go into the gym knowing that 40 minutes or 45 minutes, and that's about as much as I do, I, I, I use it to clear my mind and not break records. If I'm going to go for a 5K run and I'm not stressed out, I'll try and hit a good time. If I'm stressed out, I'm just going for a 5K run. And I want to just let my mind wander and think of something. So exercise every day. Uh, I meditate. Um, I don't meditate every day. I meditate when I feel like my anxiety levels or my mental health, if you like, is starting to get to a point where I want to bring it back down. I meditate. I don't sit, I, I do it on a Google. So it's literally in a YouTube. I might put in meditation for stress, meditation for sleep, guided meditation for, um, for rebalancing energy, whatever I think it might be. Uh, I do that. Um, I try and take time off now, which I didn't used to do. I still don't have lots of time off. If you own a business, sometimes it's just part of parcel. But I do force myself every now and then to put the phone down and, and enjoy and live in the moment and try and do some stuff. So they're the main things that I do. And that's seen me through the last 13, 14 years without any of the incidents that I can you know, describe earlier. Do you earlier. think your employees have seen a shift in the type of character you are through um, some of the interventions that you've introduced into your life? 100%. Um, and, and somebody once said to me, if you look at a leader in, uh, if you look at a leader in, in business or in the world even, what are the things that you like about that leader? And it's a funny question because when I was asked that, if I was asked today, what do I look at in a leader? I would look at somebody like the Liverpool manager, Jurgen Klopp. He, has, he looks fun. He's calm. His team love him. You know, he's not in this sort of dictatorship. Um, and that's how I try to adopt the same approach, principles, way of working with people that, that the leaders I respect approach. Because most of the leaders that you would respect, they're the ones that... They look like they're having fun. They've got a smile on their face. They look like they uh, have empathy. You know, they look like they, they, they enjoy what they do. They look like their staff love uh, working with them. It tends to be the kind of leaders we like, but sometimes you look at yourself. If I look at me 10 years ago, it was like, do this, work harder. And I'm talking about me, myself here as well. To my own self, it was it was constantly about, uh, I don't, yeah, and I don't know, whatever that kind of leadership is. And now, I think I'm a much calmer person, not just in work, but out of work, making decisions, 
Uh, it's about growing up. It's about self-developing. Another thing I'll say here is there will be business leaders and, and business owners or management um, who listen to this podcast that don't take themselves and their own personal development, personal awareness, anywhere like serious enough. They leave themselves to the back of the queue. What I've made sure I've done over a transitional period of time is I've put myself to the front of the queue in order to help everybody else. You know, if you're skin, you can't financially help someone. If you don't love yourself, you can't give love. So for me, I've been on a bit of a mission through my 30s, and I've probably as close to conquering it. I wouldn't say conquered, but I'm as close to conquering it in my early 40s as ever before because of that 10 years of self-awareness journey that I've been on in order to make myself foundationally good, if you like, financially found Asianly strong to be able and to help all the other people around me. I think what you've just said is so powerful because you get a lot of chief execs who work on their career development, um, but they don't work on mental awareness. So please do subscribe for weekly updates. Um, we'll have other interviews with other leaders such as Paul here. Too.